Well, welcome everyone to the June 27th uh, meeting of the Community Resources Committee. I'm the chair, Garrick Perry, and we will now call the meeting to order. Roll call, Pam. Councilor Perry? Here. Councilor Elkins? Still actually here. <laughs> Councilor Jarrett? Up here. here. Councilor Mayori? Here. All right. With that being said, uh, I just want to announce that this meeting will be audio and video recorded. Uh, and we are trying out a new hybrid method. So if you've heard this before, hear it again. Uh, please be patient as we work out any technical kinks with that. Uh, with that being said, we move on to the next item on the agenda, which is public comment. And I would like to say that I know a lot of people are here for the rezoning issue. And there will be space for people to comment just on that issue. So I would like to reserve this public comment for anything else that people might have. Um, you can raise your hand uh, if through, through the Zoom meeting, and we will call upon you if you have a pu public comment. There you go. And I will think. It doesn't seem like there are any comments uh, for right now. So we'll move on to our next item, which is approving the minutes of April 25th, 2022. I'll take a motion to approve those minutes. Move to approve. Second. All right. Okay. Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Perry. Yes. Perfect. With that being done, our next agenda item are updates and announcements from committee members. So does anyone have any updates or announcements? Um, I can just say that the next, uh, that this uh, item we have on our agenda will be also on the community resources uh, meeting agenda. That's on Monday, July 11th at 5.30 p.m. Wait, what is, you mean legislative matters? Legislative matters, sorry. Okay. Did I say something different? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're, on we, all the meetings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you. Well, with that being said, we move on to the next item, which is a presentation on trains in the valley from resident Zane Lemuski. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, and thanks for having us. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Ben Heckscher. We're co-founders of the Trains in the Valley website, which is also an advocacy group. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Ben, and he's got a slide deck to show you run through the, uh, what's going on with rail in this area, in this region. But I, I just wanna preface this by saying, this is a seminal time for rail nationwide, mostly because of the infrastructure money and also because of the fact that for many years, uh, both elected officials and, and other citizens have been working diligently behind the scenes and in public to put things in place when money becomes available. Well, it is now available. And uh, there's gonna be a lot going on. It's gonna take a few years, but it's, it's, it's move, moving forward. So now I'm gonna hand off to Ben. He can explain to you specifically what, what we're talking about. Great, thank you, Zane. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Right, yes. okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, if I do this properly, share. Okay, um, just a moment. So we put together a little 10 minute presentation uh, for this meeting to give you a bit of an overview of sort of what is the situation with particularly passenger rail service that runs through the city of Northampton. Um, oops. I can't, I, oops, sorry. So, sorry, I had, I, I fumbled uh, flipping the slides deck. Um, we always like to start our presentation with a ni nice picture. And this one in particular is from December, 2014, when 
uh, the Vermonter service, which runs between Washington and Vermont, uh, returned to Northampton. It's sort of difficult to see the different dignitaries in the picture, but sort of right in the middle uh, at about 10 o'clock is Governor DeBall, DeBall Patrick, who rode on uh, the inaugural train that uh, in this case is coming southbound from Vermont. And so a little bit about Trains of the Valley. Zane and I started the group in April, 2016, um, actually six years ago. We advocate for expanded and improved rail service, both freight and passenger in the Pioneer Valley, the three counties. We manage a uh, pretty extensive website. I like to say that probably 95% of what you can find on our website, you will not find on the MassDOT website. And that's one of the reasons we started the group uh, because there was so little information that was available from government resources, particularly MassDOT, on what was happening with the project uh, to reconstruct the line, which took place, uh, you know, five, eight years ago at this stage. Uh, Trains of the Valley is a founding member of a larger group uh, or a coalition known as the Western Mass Rail Coalition. There's four other advocacy groups in Western, actually three other advocacy groups in Western Mass that are part of that coalition. That group's primarily focused at the moment on East-West Rail through Springfield. Uh, but we're talking now about how can we sort of expand the scope. We often like to think of what we do is um, we do things that others can't do, won't do, or don't want to do. Um, and this is sort of maybe an odd saying, but a lot of things related to rail service falls, fall into different silos. Your MassDOT looks after certain things. Amtrak looks after certain things. The city of Northampton has certain responsibilities but there's not a lot of overlap. So you have to know who to go to to get things resolved. Such as exam an example, uh, a year ago or so, the trash cans at the station were overflowing and people were complaining about it. And it took a while, but we were able to figure out how it was or how it is that we have to get the trash cans cleared to the station. Uh, come on. So the current service today, uh, the North-South line, which is the only uh, set of train tracks that is, are, still exist in Northampton. The rest obviously are bike trails. Uh, it's owned by a company known as CSX. I'm sorry, it's owned by MassDOT. Uh, the pasture rail operator is Amtrak. There's one southbound and one northbound train that comes through known as the Vermonter. And then there's the Valley Flyer service, which comes through from Greenfield running south in the morning and running late in running northbound in the evening. Uh, this might be difficult to see, but this is the sort of an overview of the current schedule for southbound service <clears throat> with Greenfield shown at the top. Uh, this is an example of something that we do that others won't do. Amtrak uh, amazingly does not, no longer publishes printed timetables uh, or even online timetables. So we prepared our own timetable and we have it uh, on the website and also at locations in Northampton, including the platform, so people can get an overview of what's available. Most people take the train to New York City and back, but as you can see here, if you can see the fine print, you know, if you get on in Northampton, there's a lot of places that you can actually get to between here and New Haven and New York City. Looking now specifically at the station in Northampton, the platform is owned by MassDOT, the tracks are owned by MassDOT, but importantly, the parking lots are all owned by a private entity known as Harmonic Rock Realty, which is the, are the owners of Union Station. This presents um, some challenges for people who don't quite understand how and where they can park. Um, this is sort of a problem that sort of can't easily be solved, so I won't go into it at the moment. Uh, but I just wanted to make you aware of sort of what the picture uh, looks like at the station. This is a uh, overview of the ridership over the last five, six years. Obviously ridership decreased significantly during COVID. Uh, prior to COVID, the ridership out of Northampton was growing at about 10 to 11 to 12% per year. Um, and we expect that to actually increase now that both, now that the Valley Flyers Services running 
and the mantra which was suspended during COVID is back and running, back and running. So looking at the future a little bit for Northampton, um, what we're advocating for is that the Valley Flyer service continue as a sort of a permanent service, as some call it. Um, but one of the problems or issues that people have with the Valley Flyer is the train returns really late in the evening. For a lot of people, it's too late to come back at 10 o'clock at night or arrive back at 12, 12 in the morning. If you live in Greenfield, the train doesn't arrive till about 1240 in the morning. And from numbers that we've seen from people riding the train, there aren't many people on what we call the midnight train. Uh, there's need for improvements to the track in Springfield. I won't go into any detail over that, but if you've ridden either the Vermont or the Valley Flyer, you know that both trains have to back in and out of the station. That should not be necessary, but it's something that's left over from uh, call it history. And we'd also like to see what we call a fair, fair structure for the Valley Flyer, um, which means that the problem with the fares at the moment is that they're set dynamically by Amtrak, which is sort of like how the air airline set it. And the fare structure for service for taking the train from Holyoke, Northampton and Greenfield is much higher than taking the train from Springfield and Point South. Uh, if you can read this or see this, it gives you an example that if you want to go from Northampton to uh, New Haven, as example, it's $34. But if you want to go from Springfield, it's $12.75 or $13. What we believe has to happen is the fares that are shown in yellow need to be harmonized, if you will, with the fares that are shown in blue, which are the Hartford Line fares. And we're hoping that once we sort of get out of the pilot phase of the Valley Flyer that there'll be reconsideration of the fares by MASTA and Antra. Another exciting thing that's coming uh, at some point, probably in a few years, is that there will be direct service from Northampton once again to Montreal. Those of you who've lived in Northampton for a long time will know that there used to be an overnight train known as the Montrealer that uh, will get you into Montreal about 10 o'clock in the morning. There are efforts to get the Vermonter back across the international border into Montreal, but shall we say it's complicated. Um, we think this will bring, or Amtrak knows this will bring a lot of new ridership to the Vermonter, especially people southbound from Montreal coming down to this region. You know, There are historic family connections between Western Mass and Quebec going back many generations. Uh, and it's important to point out that this is the number one priority for the Vermont DOT, which is the Vermont Agency Transportation. Uh, but the real issues right now lie in Canada and specifically in Quebec and at Central Station, where they need to do some significant facility upgrades to allow for customs uh, and immigration preclearance to take place at the station. But this is working now and starting to move forward. Uh, particularly uh, under this administration in Washington. And we expect, or most people expect, this will come in probably two to three years. So why is passenger rail important in Northampton? It gives people the ability to drive, or sorry, travel longer distances without driving themselves. It gives you easy access to New York City, Montreal in a few years, Boston with East West Rail, hopefully in a few years, obviously climate friendly. Um, and Importantly, there's a, there's a public transit option here to get, to get to Bradley Airport. Uh, Peter Pan dropped their service to Bradley, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. I don't have the exact date, but there's an ability now that you can take the train to Windsor Locks where there's a direct bus connection from Windsor Locks on weekdays to Bradley. <clears throat> and this, <clears throat> excuse me, this connection is only going to improve when Connecticut rebuilds the station of Windsor Locks over the next two years. And obviously this service increases the attractiveness of Northampton as a place to live, visit and work. So that's sort of our quick run through overview of the rail service in the area. And if there are any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, but I didn't want to go on, <clears throat> excuse me, too long, but uh, we were invited to the meeting and thank you very much. And sort of that's our presentation. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Zane. 
both for the presentation. Councilors, do you have any questions? Court comment. Council Mayor. Yes, thank you very much, um, Zane and Ben. That was that was really informative and brought back memories of taking the Montreal or when I was in college here. It was a fabulous trip. Um, I guess my question would be, uh, in this post-pandemic world, how do you see um, the impact of more folks working remotely on, on the use of trains? Um, do you think that, for example, people using trains will be more for, you know, visiting and recreation as opposed to commuting, or do you think that's that equation will stay relatively the same? Thank you. I would, I would you want to speak to that, Zane, or shall I? Well, uh, uh, briefly, I'll say that I, I think it will be a benefit for riding the rails because um, even, even if people are working remotely, it might be one day a week or a couple of days a month where they'll have to uh, travel. And it's a better way to do it. They'll be able to work while they're on the train. So uh, people, people do that now. And people have been commuting by train. Um, uh, when I was going to Philadelphia, I, I often would uh, ride with someone who was living in Pennsylvania, but working in Brattleboro. And they'd, they'd make the trip once or twice, well, once, once, a, month, once a week. And uh, so I could see that as a model going forward. More, more riding trains, not less. Thank ben, you. Ben, do you want to comment? No, oh, that's good. Alex? Yeah, thank you. I um, appreciate the presentation. You've touched on all of your advocacy points, uh, really touch on a lot of what I've observed uh, when I've traveled um, in terms of fare structure and in terms of you know, the station in Springfield. Um, so the, from Springfield to New Haven is a commuter service uh, that operates in conjunction with Amtrak uh, and that you can get on either train, either a the you know, Connecticut Department of Transportation train or an Amtrak train and pay the same fare. Um, is there any move for a commuter type service north of Springfield that would you know, connect people to be able to uh, go to work in Olyoke, to go to work in Springfield or, or point south? There, there has been talk about doing that, but there's been no concrete efforts yet to do that. Uh, Representative Sabadosa in particular has sort of been the point on this with MassDOT at some level. And what we've been, we've been talking to her and what we'd like to see is that, that there would be this sort of extension of some of the Hartford line service north to Greenfield or basically bringing these two services together. It shouldn't be that north of Springfield is three times the price of south of Springfield. Mm -hmm. If you harmonize the prices, it should be then possible for people to, mm -hmm. without thinking too much, get on the train and go to Hartford. Um, if they have a meeting or some reason to go to Hartford. But if you tell them it's you know, 20 or $25 each way, they're not going to do that for most people. And there's also uh, environmental justice issues to this, really, that on the Hartford line, the fares really are acceptable to a large percentage of the population. The, the fares north of Springfield, you know, it's out of reach for a lot of people. And we feel that those fares need to be brought together. So this is looked at as a single quarter rather than two different quarters, just because there's a state line. Right, great, thank you. Uh, um, we, we know that there are populations, for example, in Springfield who need to get to um, Amherst via Northampton or even Greenfield and vice versa. So uh, if, if the fares were more reasonable and the time and the schedule is more reasonable, we think there will be a lot, lot more people. We're not, we don't call it commuting, we call it intra valley. Great. Uh, one more question was about the parking situation. Uh, you know, we do have long term parking available in the parking garage. Is there a uh, information available to folks about that? You know, for example, signs at the station or uh, in other ways to say, you know, you, you could park in the parking garage and um, catch the train. Uh, <clears throat> and is, 
So just just curious about that, if that makes any logistical sense for folks. So, so if you go on the internet and you search on Northampton Station, the web page for that we have, we have a specific web page for each station on the line. And there's one for Northampton. And there's a specific parking section that details basically the two options, either park at the station or park in the garage. And we give even the walking instructions, how to get from the garage to the station. And basically we try to keep that page as updated as possible uh, because Amtrak doesn't do that kind of stuff. Um, so yes, it's out there, but it's basically you have to do a search on the on the internet to find it. Right. Welcome to our website. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I I have a quick question. And it is I noticed that the operator uh, for the things north of Springfield are is Amtrak, but it's funded by Mass DOT. And it says that you know, these, the Windsor Locks and Ford, the fares are set by Connecticut DOT. Is there a reason why Amtrak is setting these fares north? Um, the short answer is that the service north of Springfield is, is managed or contracted by MassDOT, and MassDOT works with Amtrak to set the fares. The service south of Springfield, on the, the Amtrak service south of Springfield is contracted by both MassDOT and CONDOT, the Connecticut Department of Transportation, but primarily CONDOT sets the fares uh, because they basically mandated that these are the fares we want on our service to for a broad set of the population. And uh, MassDOT, when they launched the Valley Flyer service, basically decided that they were gonna focus more on intercity travel to New York City. So they didn't really look at interregional fares as an option during the pilot phase. And we want them to look at that after the pilot because basically they're running empty seats on the trains at the moment from Greenfield to Springfield. And why not fill them uh, to Springfield or to Hartford or to New Haven? You know. I'm, I'm just gonna add that um, there's been a sea change at MassDOT. You know, there's a new secretary, there's a new rail administrator and uh, our local politicians are very sympathetic to this. And, and so I think uh, some changes are coming. You know, when, as Ben mentioned before, the, the Valley Flyer is a quote unquote pilot service, but it'll soon be permanent service. And then maybe some significant changes can be made. I also just wanna briefly say that um, we have friends in Washington, um, Congressman Neal has been a huge advocate for rail. He, he um, announced running for city council in, in Springfield and in the station, Springfield Union Station when it was decaying. And he worked diligently and, and persistently for 30 years to finally get that station um, uh, renovated. He's also uh, kind of the point lead person on the East, East West Rail. By the way, if you really want to get to Boston by rail today, you can do it. Uh, it's easier to get back from Boston to Springfield because it's a long distance train. It's the Lakeshore Limited and it goes from uh, Boston to, uh, it's a spur of the Lakeshore Limited that starts in Boston and, and goes to Chicago. That's usually on time. If you're going the other direction, you know, it could be significantly late because it's starting in Chicago, but you can do it. And when the East-West Rail uh, finally um, happens, it's gonna be along that route, the same route that's there right now. Okay. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? All right. Well, with that being said, I want to, again, thank you, Zane, and thank you, Ben, for joining us and informing this committee and the public about this. And I look forward to your next presentation uh, in the legislative matters, I believe. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much. It's still weird. <laughs> with, with that, uh, that takes us to our next item, and it has been referred. It is... Uh, item 22.110, an ordinance to rezone 130 Pine Street from 
URB to a office industrial, and it was referred to the planning board, community resources, and legislative matters. Um, I believe we have Carolyn. Yes, there, there she is. Hello, Carolyn. Um, I think you could probably speak to this better than I could ever. So if you want to take the floor. <laughs> sure. Thanks for inviting me. And I apologize. I wasn't there in person. Um, still playing catch up from being away and didn't realize you guys were doing in person. Um, so the zoning ordinance amendment that was referred um, actually has been to planning board already, but just um, to um, describe it. So we there, so the process, let me just do a quick background. The process for zoning amendments um, are such that they require anything that's introduced as a zoning amendment requires a public hearing in front of um, the planning board and the subcommittee of city council legislative matters before it comes back to full council um, for um, consideration and a vote. So each of those subcommittees that hold official public hearings on the item make recommendations to the full council. City council also referred it to your committee as a um, as another stop for an opportunity for conversation about this um, outside of sort of that public hearing um, strict public hearing um, framework. And so where the ordinance is now is that it went to planning board June 9th for official public hearing. Planning board heard um, comments and then made a recommendation to move it forward to full council with, um, and knowing that this was also part of the process that it would come to your committee. So that's um, sort of the um, status of this ordinance. The ordinance itself is a recommendation for what we call a map, a zoning map amendment. So it's changing the geographic boundaries of the office industrial zone. And um, Pam, I don't know if you can, if you have the, if the items up on the screen in council chambers, or if you could share screen for, with that. Um, I did pull it. I don't know if that's easy for you or not, but I can, I do have a web link up if um, you want me to share it, but I just thought it might be helpful to sort of look at the surrounding map. Um, let me just see if I can do, okay, so you've, I can't, I am disabled from sharing. Okay, great. Oh, That's great. awesome. Um, so the map in front of you, um, on the screen shows the area that we're talking about um, just south of Florence Center. The um, area that's shaded in pink is currently uh, what we refer to as office industrial zone. And then where the, you see an orange boundary around the edge of that pink hatching is the urban residential B zone. Um, and there's a blue rectangle right next to the orange hatching um, that is labeled as 23A146. That's the parcel in question or the subject of this zoning amendment, proposed zoning amendment, just sort of just expand that pink hatched office industrial zone one parcel um, to incorporate uh, the Florence Congregational Church property. And the reason behind this is to help um, facilitate the reuse and the future viability of this historic building uh, by allowing an expanded um, range of uses that could be, um, could happen on this property. Um, some counselors may remember that just a few years ago, we came, went through the same zoning process for the um, the um, Florence um, Grammar School right next door. And that was also in the urban residential B and the same process was undertaken again to, to open up the range of opportunities for reuse of that building so that it could um, attract um, 
reinvestment in a way that would maintain that historic and in integrity of, of that corner with that historic school. And so the same I, um, rationale uh, has um, pushed us forward to sort of evaluate expanding that for um, this property, the Florence Congregational Church. Um, the, there are, this is not the only possible path to allow um, flexibility in the reuse of religious structures. Currently in all the zoning districts in the city, we have a um, allowance um, that was adopted probably eight years ago to facilitate the reuse of uh, a number of these historic um, institutional um, uses and buildings that are in residential districts and um, to achieve sort of the similar outcome, permanently protecting the historic um, buildings that are on these properties, but allowing more flexibility in the reuse of those um, buildings. So the um, Clark School on Round Hill Road is a recent example of um, a path in which um, the new owners were able to follow and obtain permitting for uses that aren't typically allowed in the residential district, but because we changed the zoning that opened up the opportunity for new uses, though the development team um, on Round Hill Road for the reuse of the Clark School campus, uh, went through the planning board process and was able to get approval for um, an, uh, office uses and other uses that aren't typically allowed in the residential zone, but with the caveat that they would have to record a permanent um, historic preservation restriction on the property as part of that permit approval. So this is an analogous um, uh, process here. In this case, we're also recommending that a, a side agreement or what we call a development agreement with um, Bombix, who is the user now in conjunction with the church that would like to um, have more events that aren't allowed in the urban residential B district, but would be allowed in the office industrial district and allow that building to, um, in a sense, um, create um, income and revenue that helps permanently protect that um, building. So the preservation restriction that um, would sort of go hand in hand with this would also stipulate that, um, I'm sorry, the development agreement would stipulate that an historic preservation restriction be put in place um, within um, so many days or weeks of the adoption by city council of this zoning change. We've done this kind of development agreement and zoning changes with other properties in the city. So it's not new. It's not um, something that happens all the time, but it's certainly one way to um, um, sort of um, provide for the um, outcomes that the city would be interested in um, seeing realized. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if that, um, if I, if there are any. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, and I guess the way that, that I'm going to do this is first open it up to counselors, see if they have any questions or comments, and then allow the public to have some space to, to say some things. Counselors, do you have any questions, comments? Council Mayori. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Alex and I, Council Jarrett and I um, have met with uh, the residents and Bombix. And so there's some, everyone's been very thoughtful and, and I think there's a lot um, of valid questions and concerns and we can share more about that. But uh, Carolyn, if you could go into more detail about the interplay between historic preservation, the status of, of historic preservation and office industrial, because that was a, a little bit of a point of confusion. How, sure. yeah. <clears throat> sure. So um, the office industrial zone allows um, entertainment um, functions as part of the general land use um, regulations, whereas urban residential B doesn't. 
We also don't have the provision in office industrial for expanding the realm of uses for the preservation of these historic properties because currently there aren't any churches or schools that are in um residential, I'm sorry, office industrial zones. So we don't have the same zoning language in the office industrial as we do the residential zones. Um, the reason um, office industrial also allows other back office uses and, um, and research and development and um, uses that aren't allowed in the residential district. And so, and because this parcel is immediately abuts on two sides of the office industrial that we felt it made sense to sort of open up the opportunity for that. But with the caveat that we would do that only to protect the, uh, and keep that building intact because that's, um, I think in terms of the uses that might go into um, a former church building. And I will say the, the religious uses that are um, um, occupying the building now are not going away by any means. That's not um, certainly what we've been told is envisioned and there's, there's certainly viable uses now, but this is just sort of setting the stage for um, both near-term but long-term opportunities to protect the building. And so since, um, Office Industrial doesn't require preservation of historic buildings. Um, the side agreement or the development agreement that um, stipulates that the building has to be protected or have an historic preservation restriction, which would be a 30 year restriction on the building, that then um, guarantees the city that that structure won't be demolished for let's say, oh, um, you know, if the owner or say some future owner comes in and says, you know, you know what, now I have office industrial zone, I'm just going to tear this building down and build a nice new, you know, three-story um, office building. This preservation restriction sort of keeps everything as it sits in the neighborhood intact, um, at least for 30 years, because that's the longest that we can have a preservation restriction on a property. And so that's why we're suggesting to go this path because it opens up the opportunity. So it's not so much about the uses that happen inside, but it's keeping that sort of the visual and physical presence of that building intact in the neighborhood, but while allowing um, the reuse of the building and the current, um, um, entity Bombix that wants that has started reusing this space is also sort of um, allows them to um, grow uh, in terms of providing that sort of cultural arts function that um, in Florence that um, I think is a positive um, brings positivity to Florence and the whole city. And I think people support that um, idea, but also, so it's sort of a win-win situation where we're, you know, we have a goal of supporting arts and culture, obviously in the community, and that will help bring in resources to then permanently protect historical resources in the community. Thank you. And Council Jarrett. Thank you. Um, so yeah, as Councilman Mayori said, we, we have met uh, with Bombix and with many residents. The concerns that I have heard express uh, noise concerns with the with music and also with folks uh, coming staying after and making noise in the neighborhood, uh, parking concerns um, as well. And um, Bombix has been very proactive uh, in reaching out now and meeting with neighbors um, and also they are working on being proactive in, in terms of noise, in terms of making measurements to make sure they're in compliance, in terms of parking to put up signs that uh, direct people to where they can park because they've made an arrangement with the Florence Community Center to, for folks to be able to park there. Um, so I think there is, there's a lot of, of positive uh, connections happening um, to about the impacts uh, and um, 
there, so what I think one of the questions that I have is we've talked a lot um, about the development agreement uh, with Bombix and the neighbors um, as to whether there should be any additional restriction in there around say the how late shows could go or the number of shows that could happen. However, uh, the license commission and the mayor's office um, have a have a so in order to have an entertainment license, they need to uh, Bombix needs to get a mayoral entertainment license. And then if there's any liquor involved, um, then or alcohol rather, um, then they would also need to get uh, approval from the license commission. And that there are uh, th those the license commission and the mayor's office have a, a good deal of uh, discretion regarding um, neighbor complaints and issues in the neighborhood as far as uh, being able to say, you know, you need to do this in order to keep having your entertainment license. So the question is kind of what should go in a development agreement versus what should just will be taken care of by having those licenses from the mayor's office or the license commission. So, you know, theoretically, you can put anything in a side ag development agreement. However, the more that there's overlap with other regulatory procedures, um, the more it becomes complicated in terms of who has jurisdiction to enforce and who are people, you know, how long does it take? Um, so as you mentioned, the license commission and through the mayor's office as well has um, actually even more regulatory control than in zoning to actually stop an activity that's taking place. Whereas in zoning um, and and I would argue as well that this uh, would be affected by the development agreement because I think the um, zoning code enforcement officer would be in charge of enforcing any development agreement. And so then there would be sort of this winding path for how you get enforcement of certain elements of an, in a de development agreement. Um, on the other hand, the license commission um, can... Uh, can withdraw license. So a license isn't a guarantee that something can happen forever. It's just a license for the stipulated time and the framework that's granted to whoever's um, requesting the license. Um, whereas in zoning, once you've granted permission for something, you're allowed to do that thing unless you're violating some other zoning um, aspect. So you mentioned noise there's a noise ordinance and no matter what, um, you know, the, the, you can write something in there about noise, but a develop, but the zoning still stands and the building commissioner as the zoning code enforcement officer would be required to go and um, investigate complaints about noise and noise is, you know, a, a measurement across a span of time. It's not just you know, blips of noise here and there. So it's more of a technical analysis and that can take time. Whereas, um, and, but it's not, it doesn't mean that something is necessarily gonna stop. So the license commission on the other hand has a much more, um, uh, I would say a heavier hand in being able to address something that really isn't meeting the, the parameters of a license that's been granted. And probably a much more expedient way to address issues if they come up. Um, you know, parking will, as you know, as counselors, um, parking relates to the people who is, are doing the parking. <laughs> and sometimes people aren't always careful with or think about where they're going or where they're parking or how they're impacting other people when they park in the street. And this is an issue all over the city. It doesn't really matter what the use is. I mean, it can be, you know, at Cooper's Corner, it can be, you know, at the Y or wherever. Um, so it's a little bit harder to contain, but, it's, but I know that Bombix, has, I mean, the great thing is that there's underutilized paved parking right next door. And um, certainly from the city perspective, we think it's much better for um, 
uh, joining users to share that space because they don't have, you know, what we don't want to do is create more and more parking and impervious surface in the city that's only going to be used a small percentage at the time. So um, I think, I mean, it's great to hear that they've been addressing that, but I think, um, you know, that's not, that's something that would be hard to put into a development agreement anyway, and then enforce it. You know, if you say only X number of cars can be on a, you know, in one area at a time, who's going to enforce it? And, you know, I think it becomes really problematic. So I guess that's a long way of saying, yes, you can add things into a development agreement, but it becomes quite cumbersome, not only for enforcement, but also for the next user, because it the development agreement gets passed on to the next um, owner. And so, you know, we want to be careful about that because, Again, the whole point of rezoning is to encourage a flexibility in the types of reuses so that we can protect this building. And so the more that you put, you know, constraints that might affect the long-term viability of a property, um, the, the less we're meeting our goals of trying to create that flexibility. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Yeah. I, perhaps I should wait until after. I don't know if there's any member of the public or. Yeah. Okay. So we can, you think? we can wait. And, and because this is not a formal public hearing, I, but I do believe that it's important to hear from voices from the community. So we can open up the public comment for a bit. I just ask that everyone be respectful for other members and um, there you go. So I, I unfortunately cannot see that far. That's Cassandra Holden who has her hand okay. up. Her hat, her hand up there. there you go, Cassandra. Then. Thank you. Um, and thank you for taking the time tonight to look at this proposal and, uh, you know, hear about our plans. So, um, you know, just sort of a brief history of this property and the project. Is the Florence Congregational Church had been looking for several years um, to find a buyer for the property um, that would allow them to remain in place and also enable the um, existing tenants, the Cloverdale Preschool and the Reform Synagogue Beta Hava to replain in, remain in place. They, as a congregation, had been shrinking in size and the work and expense of maintaining this, you know, large, somewhat unwieldy historic property um, was really beyond them um, financially and in terms of their sort of internal um, resources for people to, you know, take on responsibilities um, in handling that. So um, we came in and we, um, Bombix has a six and a half year lease to own agreement with the FCC. Um, and key to that agreement is that uh, the congregation you know, once the six and a half term is up, uh, the congregation will have a 99 year lease, which will enable them to remain, you know, on that site, um, you know, for that period of time, which was, you know, critical to them, but it's also, you know, that's part of our commitment to that remaining sacred space um, and a multi-use space. Um, and, you know, our project has really been to develop a business plan that, you know, enlivens that area, but also generates enough revenue to support the, you know, the physical structure and all of the work that needs to take place um, to maintain that, you know, in perpetuity. So, you know, obviously, you know, the arts are an important factor in that project. Um, you know, we've been doing programming a couple of nights a week. We are in the process of renovating and getting permitted the commercial kitchen that's on site. So creating um, the first collaborative commercial kitchen in Hampshire County, there are similar projects in Greenfield and Holyoke. And um, so the combination for us of creating um, rehearsal and rental, rehearsal and rental, rental space for meetings and other types of activities, bringing the arts into the project, and then also bringing this commercial kitchen into the project mean that there are essentially three sources of revenue to support the building you know, should we have another COVID surge and, you know, gathering and performance becomes non-viable, then, you know, the commercial kitchen exists as a source of revenue. These, you know, smaller meetings and, you know, those types of activities, office space, that becomes an important source of re revenue. And then, you know, over time, as the needs and desires of the community change, again, the building, the property, our stewardship of it can evolve so that there's a, you know, 
so that it continues to be there as an important community resource. Um, and the, the rezoning is critical to that, both to enable the arts and entertainment piece, but also for, to enable us to operate the commercial kitchen, which is, a, as I said, an important source of revenue for the project. Um, we've met with the neighbors a couple of different times now and also, you know, have been engaging with them in, you know, conversation and via email. Um, I think that, you know, their, their concerns are important and valid. And so, you know, we've moved ahead with creating signage that we deploy, um, you know, at different events to instruct people as to, you know, how to park in, a, in an appropriate way and use, utilize the resources that are there. Um, we have a wonderful agreement with uh, the folks over at the community center. And actually the revenue generated from parking, you know, is, is not insignificant for them. Um, so that's, you know, that activity is contributing financially to the, you know, that sort of the block, if, if you will. Um, we've also, you know, adjusted the timing of our programming so that, you know, things are ending earlier. So it's less disruptive in the neighborhood and factoring that into future programming that's coming. Um, I think it's also important to note that it's not just uh, the arts and entertainment programming that, that's, uh, that has an impact on the neighborhood. For example, you know, when there are either of the congregations has allowed, you know, has a large gathering or has an event that's held outside, you know, there are sonic implications and parking implications in the neighborhood. So, you know, I'm interested in, you know, coming to, you know, a respectful and perhaps informal agreement with the neighborhood. Um, but to me, it feels important not to bake these things into the development agreement so that we have the flexibility in this project to evolve, but also to respond, you know, as as the needs of the neighbors and as as the neighborhood changes, you know, something that's, you know, set in stone for 30 years becomes very difficult to unstick. And I feel like we've engaged in a really constructive and, um, you know, important process with the neighbors to hear their concerns and, you know, respond quickly to that. Perfect. Thank you. Anyone else? I am seeing no more comments there in the audience. Council Mayori. Yeah, so I was really impressed with Cassandra and Kyle's kind of demonstrated um, commitment to going above and beyond um, in terms of um, working with the residents, because as we all know, you know, we have these no noise ordinances, but the concerns of the residents, you can imagine like the chronic nature of, of having, um, you know, a business like that near you. Um, I just felt like uh, I, I, Kyle uh, talked about their plan to assess the noise issues and how to, and, and using that information to mitigate it. And this all goes beyond just, um, just, you know, the letter of the law, because, um, I, you know, what I heard from Cassandra and Kyle is they, they really want to be good neighbors. So they, they don't want to just have it be, okay, we didn't break the law, so you can't, you know, go after us. And and the neighbors don't want to have, have to call and complain. They, the neighbors expressed um, enthusiasm about the, 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 the mission of Bombic. So I, I heard um, a lot of good things coming in terms of the neighborhood working, the residents working with Bombix. And as Cassandra said, I was really impressed with this part of the issue before us tonight is this zoning change. And, and for this commercial kitchen, which is a critical component of their viability, this, this zoning change has to happen. And also, frankly, it's, it's a benefit for the entire community. I mean, I'm thinking of like um, Florence Night Out, you know, out and these kind and food trucks and all those places that could benefit from that. So that's, so in terms of the issue here tonight, because I, because residents aren't speaking, you know, here to speak, I will represent their concern, which would be, will this zoning change kind of make it more difficult for them to to have their concerns addressed or and, and such. My impression from, from Carolyn and from Cassandra and Kyle is no, but that, I think that's really what's before us in terms of tonight's um, recommendation. So I guess that is kind of a question to 
Carolyn, I, I suppose that is a question. Yeah. <laughs> or yes. Um so um you want to know if even the development agreement for the historic preservation piece is too constrained? Well, I, 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 the neighbors, the neighbors cons were concerned about this zoning change and yeah. because it does allow for more flexibility, but within that flexibility, it might allow in their, you know, in terms of the, they're concerned about allow for more, um, I suppose, um, noise and, and yeah. things that might, you know, intrusions into their lives. I'm from, More I mean, my impression is that that isn't true. I mean, we're taught the commercial kitchen it, that, that the, the, the concerns the neighbors have aren't around the reasons for this zoning change, but I just wanted to, because rep, you know, residents aren't here to speak. I, I just really want to bring this, this, this particular yeah. point about tonight's, you know, mission home that this change doesn't really change the paradigm of like what, you know, how we're going to address their concerns or how Bombix would. And I guess I'm looking right. for confirmation from you, Carolyn, on that. Yeah. I mean, I, I like I said, the zoning already has a noise ordinance provision. Um, and so that no matter what the use is there, no matter where you are in the city, everyone is, is, um, needs to meet that standard, you know, can't exceed that standard, I should say. And um, so even if um, another user in, you know, residential user came in and was, you know, having parties <laughs> late at night or doing, you know, some accessory uses, the noise standard is still applicable, no matter who the user is. Um, there are also other avenues that, as I mentioned before, the licensing avenue um, is it, it will be in play for any events where they're selling tickets or where there's um, liquor sales. So again, that's sort of another path of oversight that's outside the zoning. Um, and yes, there are other uses that would be allowed, but um, Again, sort of the, um, uh, I think uh, as um, it would be very probably similar to some of the other, um, you know, office industrial, I guess, you know, I'm trying to think of any other thing that maybe under the office industrial zone might um, cause concern. You know, we don't allow, um, you know, retail type uses in office industrial. So it's not like being an, you know, um, Florence Center, you know, it can't be a convenience store or something like that there under office industrial. Um, so I really think that um, this type of zoning is, um, it is a good fit, especially given that the rest, you know, sort of the side in the rear of this um, property is this or, um, have the same uses. Um, and then the other thing I would say is if this zoning doesn't go forward, there is another path that um, in the within the context of urban residential B that would require a minor zoning change, but it essentially would get you to the same place, but it just doesn't open up as many uses um, wouldn't necessarily allow commercial kitchen and that kind of thing. So I, I feel like there are already regulations in place in the zoning now um, that um, address the bulk of the concerns um, from the neighborhood. My last question is that I, uh, Cassandra, I, I think shared this at the meeting, but remind me where, what, um, what's the status of the development agreement? Is this a work in progress? I see it attached. Is this the final? Uh, my impression was that it was still being was still being worked on. It will be for a little bit. Yeah. So I, I don't. I mean, I'll, um, Cassandra and I were having a conversation about this this afternoon. It is still a work in progress. In fact, where our office is drafting an historic preservation restriction, um, so that. Um, um, Bombix and Cassandra can understand what, what it would look like for this property because they're all a little bit different. But we have the we have 
sort of essentially templates because we've done this with a lot of um, several um, properties around the city. And so, you know, that might result in some fine tuning of the language. What um, I believe would be important is that before it goes to the um, full city council again, that um, that development agreement language be um, in place and ready to go. Um, and that we still have over a month before that happens because we're still in, you know, this goes to legislative matters for public hearing and then goes back to city council. Thank you. Awesome. Any other comments, questions? Well, I think before we move to recommendation, I just want to say a thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, Cassandra, and everyone who joined us uh, for this portion. And I, I do have to say that when Bombix was announced, I was really excited. Um, as an arts and entertainment city, we find ourselves in a position where we have very few venues, and Bombix has been a, a bright light during these dark times. And I, I'm really excited about not only the mission that you guys have already stated, but the addition to, of a commercial kitchen. That sounds really exciting. Um, and I, for one, really would like to support in any way we can having more um, arts for the community because I think that that is one of the biggest community builders for a town or a city. So, you know, that's where I stand. And with that, I would take a, do we do a motion for a recommendation? Yeah. I'll make a positive recommendation, a motion for a positive recommendation to Full City Council. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All right, PM, roll call, please. Wait, uh, oh, sorry, wait. I wanted to. If I oh, could sorry, say sorry. something to that motion, speak to that motion. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Go ahead, Council Chair. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I I feel that um, when, with, with as, as, as I spoke about, and Carolyn spoke about the, the issue of, of licensing, as uh, an avenue to address future concerns. I think that that, that is a, in, in any of the entertainment possibilities that we see under this new zoning. Um, I think that that'll be a very important place. Also though, that the, you know, the, the development agreement is still ongoing and there is potentially a place um, for concerns from the neighborhood to go into that. Um, and uh, so I will, I will be continuing that process, uh, both with Bombix and the neighborhood, to, to make sure that all the voices are heard. Um, but I feel comfortable moving forward uh, positively at, at this point and look forward to legislative matters and our future discussions as well. All right. Thank you, Council Jarrett. Now, PM. Council Jarrett. Yes. Yes. Councilor Perry? Yes. Councilor Elkins? Yes. And I move forward with a positive recommendation. And that takes us to our next item on the agenda, which is new business. So do, does anyone have any new business? Seeing none, that moves us to our next and last item, quite possibly my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn for my first hybrid meeting. Move to adjourn. Second. Hey, I'm roll call, please. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Perry. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Yay, we did it, everybody.